The Shadow Energy Minister Ted O'Brien is arguing that coal towns which host, it, host its proposed nuclear sites would receive cheaper power and higher paying jobs for decades. The coalition has yet to announce, is yet to announce costings for its nuclear policy, but argues it is essential for the transition to net zero. Joining me now is Doctors for Nuclear Energy founder Chris Kiefer. He is a prominent left-wing Canadian nuclear advocate too, who did advise Justin Trudeau in the nuclear debate. Thanks so much, Chris. Is that an um, acceptable introduction? to you. <laughs> I'll take it, Laura. Thank you very much. OK, thank you. Now, you would have seen how our nuclear debate is raging here in Australia. It's highly political. We're just about to go to an election. What do you make of the debate as it is at the moment, but also the differences or similarities when it comes to nuclear between Australia and Canada? Yeah, it's, it's a really bizarre situation. You know, in the U.S., uh, both Biden and Trump are tripping over each other to outdo one another on their support for nuclear energy. You know, even uh, Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez is on board. Similarly, in my country, both the two main political parties are very pro-nuclear. So quite a culture shock coming to Australia. Um, I'm from Ontario. We used to have a large coal fleet. We decided to phase that out and we use nuclear energy to do that. Um, and it was a pretty rapid process. And it really was something that gave hope to coal workers who transitioned into mm -hmm. better jobs uh, in, in uh, nuclear facilities. But we don't have a nuclear industry like uh, the US or Canada. We'd need to create one. Is that the biggest impediment, do you think? Uh, listen, it's a challenge. Uh, it requires your best and brightest, but there's a long-term value proposition there, which is hard mm. to beat. Uh, I think it's a lot like the value we get from things like hydroelectricity. There's an upfront investment that's required, but you end up with, in Ontario's case, nuclear being the second cheapest source of electricity after hydroelectricity. OK. Um, we don't have the costs for from the coalition at the moment about how long or how much this would be, how long it might take. Do you have best estimates or is it just too hard to p pin down? No, we do have some emerging figures. Uh, most recently, there was a fixed price bid from the Koreans uh, in Czechia again, and the estimate there was $8.6 billion per unit. Um, doing some quick math, I believe that's about $13 billion Australian dollars. Uh, and again, that is a big upfront investment. But these nuclear stations have, you know, a 60 to 80 year lifespan and once amortized, provide very low cost power. We've seen uh, the climate wars in this uh, country dominate politics for the best part of two decades, really. Um, we have one side of politics who's uh, pursuing uh, renewables, um, somewhat, you know, things like green hydrogen and, and things like that. Um, we've seen the advancement in renewables and how quickly technology um, can catch up, and I think it's getting even faster. What is your view on, on the mix um, of renewables and nuclear? Should nuclear just be used for that firming capacity for renewables? Are you comfortable with that? I mean, I, I do think Australia is on a rather bold experiment. There are other countries around the world that have pushed a little bit further in terms of their renewable energy deployment, but they are connected, uh, take the case of Denmark, for instance, to Norway's hydroelectric uh, potential. Uh, so Australia is embarking on a rather bold experiment. What I would say is that nuclear is very well matched for industrial and mm. AI uh, demand needs that are that are there. And if, if Australia is interested in the value add of some of its mining industry, if it's interested in, you know, aluminum smelting, uh, you know, lithium hydroxide production, these are all industrial processes which are very sensitive to interruption. It is hard to imagine those processes, those highly energy intensive processes mm. running off of a combination of wind, solar and batteries predominantly. Uh, so I think nuclear is a really vital part of that mix. I think wind and solar have a place, you know, when they match need and, and solar does that to some degree in terms of matching the air conditioning load here. Certainly it has a much higher value here than it does uh, back in my uh, hometown uh, in Ontario. Yeah, that uh, makes total sense. And Matt, you're here for the Global Uranium Conference. It starts uh, tomorrow uh, in Adelaide. I think you, you're going to need to be pretty convincing, aren't you? Um, <laughs> what, what kind of reception do you expect at this conference and really across the board? Are you going to be able to meet with some of these leaders? What will you say to them if you do? 
Yeah, I mean, just on the topic of uh, the uranium sector, they're pretty euphoric right now. Um, the price of uranium is quite high. Important to remember that uh, despite all the hyping about green hydrogen, which uh, has really failed to materialize, mm -hmm. uranium represents, uh, in both Canada and uh, Australia, it offsets about one third of our total all sector CO2 emissions through its use in pow nuclear power plants around the world, providing carbon free power instead of an alternative mix, including coal and gas. Um, so, you know, I think uh, uh, there'll be a warm reception and, and enthusiasm at the conference itself. Obviously, politics here <laughs> are divided. I had the pleasure of meeting uh, with folks in the Latrobe Valley, um, and they are, I think, quite excited uh, to have an alternative opportunity um, that will not, you know, transform their region into essentially a ghost town once the coal industry is, is forced to pack up at some point. Yeah, that's true. Well, good luck at the conference. And Chris, we really appreciate you making time for AIM Agenda this morning. Appreciate it. Laura, it's a pleasure to be with you.